Okay, welcome to the Connected Pulse. This is Mike Mintz from Martindale Hubble Connected. And we're speaking today with Anton Johnson. Anton, do you want to introduce yourself to everybody? Hi, Mike. Hi, everybody. My name is Anton Johnson. I'm founding principal of Bottom Line Law Group, uh, a new firm that I just set up in L.A. and San Francisco a few months ago. Um, I am an attorney focusing mostly on consumer internet, web 2.0, social media, and other types of technology startup companies. Uh, I spent the last few years uh, as general counsel at eHarmony, and before that, I was one of the original in-house lawyers at MySpace. Um, so my practice focuses these days primarily on counseling smaller, uh, you know, lean startups and, and growth companies looking to get into uh, the consumer internet business. So tell us a little bit about MySpace. What was it like working there, and what were some of the challenges that you faced uh, as in-house counsel at MySpace? It had already become one of the fastest growing web businesses in history. So the challenge, like you get at a lot of growth companies and, and smaller companies, um, it was one of limited resources yeah. and just really exploding demand for legal services. Because at that time, was signing up probably two or 300,000 users a day. Wow. Um, hitting, hitting something on the order of a billion uh, page views a month. Wow. Really just phenomenal. So everything, you know, pressure on every point of the system. So it was a big challenge trying to uh, handle that with a team of only three in-house lawyers. The U.S. market became pretty fully penetrated by MySpace around, uh, I want to say, 2005, 2006 or so. The next big engine for growth was international expansion. And at that point, most uh, social networking sites uh, were almost all U.S. Next big uh, territory to be conquered, so to speak, was international. Um, mostly Europe and Asia. The bottom line of a user-generated content service right. is that if the operator of that service is liable for any of the speech, any of the content, any of the activities supplied by users, um, that service would be sued out of existence within a day. <laughs> right. I mean, literally, you've got millions upon millions of people, including teenagers and you know whatnot, doing, doing and saying everything you could possibly imagine. <laughs> so in the U.S., there's a couple of laws that you know, are extremely powerful safe harbors, the uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Of course, the MCA, sure. And Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Right. And those two things basically protect a service like MySpace in the U.S. from being sued for the content that our users uh, contribute. Um, the, the EU has a pretty good safe harbor, which extends, I think, to all the EU member countries. It certainly covered the U.K. and gave us comfort that we weren't entering some kind of huge, you know, risky zone in doing business there. Um, but the other big area where the EU uh, is tricky is privacy. The issue there with the EU data protection laws is that they, um, you know, we, we were storing EU citizens' personal information on servers located in the U.S. Right. And they don't consider the U.S. to be a, kind of, quote, good country uh, <laughs> and is satisfying the, uh, the standards of um, the, the strict privacy standards, frankly, of a lot of Western European countries. In Germany, where you're doing, you're doing e-commerce, so you have credit cards and, you know, you have uh, physical address and phone numbers and name it, all kinds of stuff. Sure. Physical attributes, I mean, uh, likes and dislikes, long walks on the beach. I mean, you're giving away a lot of information <laughs> on eHarmony. So. Yeah, that's actually one, yeah, that's one of the more interesting questions about, yeah, about eHarmony and other dating sites. Is there's, a, there's a big universe of data there, which doesn't fit neatly into categorization that you get um, for, you know, kind of what's considered PII, personal identifiable information, right. and what's not. And you know, normally, at least in the U.S., we pretty much divide for privacy law purposes a whole universe of data into either it's either PII or it's non-PII. PII would be things like your whole your whole real name, you know, your phone number or whatever your right. email address. Well, on a dating site, it gets pretty interesting because <laughs> you suppose you know if I'm you know Tony from New York City, okay, good luck. <laughs> You're not going to identify, right? But if I'm Anton from oh I don't know, pick a, pick a small town. Um, uh, Poughkeepsie, right, right, sure. Uh, and I'm, you know, a lawyer, and I'm, you know, you know, I'm 38 years old, right. Um, even if you don't have my last name, that might be enough to identify. What What are really the key things that somebody that wants to expand their business, take them overseas? What What are the key things you would advise they pay attention to? The EU legal structure works. The uh, The EU um, legislature will pass a directive which is more or less kind of a law in principle, and then all the member states will go on and go ahead and pass enacting uh, regulations that basically put, you know, so the British version of whatever the EU 
the data protection directive in, into effect within the UK. Right. But even so, not enough harmonization there to assume that you can comply with all those laws um, without doing an actual country by country analysis. There really are no shortcuts. Right. So that was one of the big lessons I learned. Most of the online stuff, you know, we had to deal with all the issues about um, uh, presence, you know, jurisdiction, venue, sure. so forth. For example, I think it's important for internet companies to understand if they're targeting users in a particular, or consumers in a particular country, it's all well and good to say in your in your uh, terms of use and your privacy policy and so on that hey, we're an American company and everything you do you're subject to American law and if you want to sue us, you have to come to Los Angeles. Yeah. Well, right. you know, good luck with that. Right. Um, those issues are, you know, the, what I call a kind of purposeful availment of, <laughs> you know, and, and sort of thrusting the companies, uh, the company into the stream of commerce in a particular country. To me, that's, you know, anytime you do that, you've got to assume you're going to be um, subject to that country's laws and potentially could be hauled into court over there. And um, so in my mind, it's money well spent to gauge local counsel and at least understand the kind of uh, the basic rules of the road in that jurisdiction. Yeah, you know, I want to I wanted to ask you that follow up question. I'm glad you mentioned it again. How did you source local counsel? I usually go with referrals, kind of the old fashioned way. Right. Um, you know, so in my case, I, I was fortunate enough to have worked for a string of international um, tech and media companies before getting to before starting the legal department in Harmony. And maybe you could meet those lawyers at Martin Hubble Connected, right? It's a good yeah, place. Absolutely. Good place to start meeting those yeah, in-house counsel. I mean, these tools make it so much easier nowadays. I mean, that's the other thing. You can do so much diligence on people, um, even if you haven't met them, or even if you don't have a personal referral. You know, it's so easy now to go onto a site like Barnell Hubble Connected and just you know look up and you know, and of course Googling and whatnot. But just the the whole kind of online presence that most um, lawyers I think have these days, particularly at the kind of top tier quality, um, make it very easy to to, to Figure out what they're about and um, get some comfort before you reach out and you start spending money that, you know, you're working with someone that has some credibility. You're, you're out on your own. So how, how are you doing it? Uh, my goal was in starting a new firm was to have a very broad um, uh, subject matter focus, you know, drawing on my own experience in a general counsel role, and at the same time have a pretty narrow and pretty specific industry focus, which, again, is kind of consumer internet, social media, web 2.0 digital media, all that good stuff, right. which seems to me to be a good space to be in these days because yeah. there are so many entrepreneurs uh, coming up with so many new uh, ideas and starting businesses around them. And a lot of those companies, you know, being small companies, limited resources, uh, bootstraps, you know, self-financed, maybe getting along with a very small amount of seed capital, you know, my view was there's an opportunity there to serve as counsel to those guys um, with a lower, uh, a leaner kind of cost structure, frankly, than large firms. Okay, so this is uh, a series of, of 10 questions used by James Lipton on Inside the Actor's Studio. So I thought since uh, this is our Inside the Lawyer's Firm kind of uh, video series, it would be interesting to uh, see your answers to these questions. So we'll begin. Number okay. one, what is your favorite word? Protagonist. And what is your least favorite word? Can I go with a phrase? Sure. Uh, outside the box. <laughs> what turns you on? Uh, technology. I'm such a geek. <laughs> and what what turns you off? Bureaucracy. Great. What sound or noise do you love? Uh, the sound of the coffee grinder when they're about to make an espresso. And what sound or noise do you hate? Jackhammering. What is your favorite curse word? Curse word? Yeah, we'll bleep, we'll bleep it out. We'll bleep it out? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Uh, musician. And what profession would you not like to do? Accounting. Me too. Sorry. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Um, all is forgiven. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you, Anton Johnson. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I'm, I'm founding principal at Bottom Line Law Group in bottom? San Francisco and Santa Monica, California.